All right, so we can get started. I'm gonna mute myself and when you're ready. Ready when you are. Okay. Okay, so that's it. We're rolling then, huh, Marley? Good stuff. Okay. The meeting is uh, up and running. And we're being broadcast live out to out to our good friends on YouTube. Okay, well, I hope, hope there are some good folks out there on YouTube and that you have some questions. There we go. Okie doke. Sorry, Marley. There we go. Okay. So uh, welcome, Hop Hog Library. Marley is the director of the program tonight. So if anything gets messed up, make sure you tell Marley, okay? Uh, as in Bob Marley. That's what Marley said. That's how she said, remember my name, like Bob Marley. So thank you, Marley, for uh, setting this up. Thank you, Krista, for having us back here. And if you are uh, watching on YouTube, I'm not going to be able to see the comments or the questions. So please uh, put them in there because Marley is watching and she will alert me. She will tell me what is going on. So happy summer, everybody. I hope it's going well. My summer's going well, uh, I think. It's a uh, blink of an eye and it's already towards the end of July. I can't believe this, but here we are. So I have two uh, really good summer dishes for you. Uh, we have a fluke dish and we have a steak dish. And the reason I chose fluke is because it's such a uh, popular catch off of the South shore of Long Island. You can get some fluke in the sound as well. So I, I shouldn't exclude the folks from the North. North Shore, but South Shore of Long Island, Jersey Shore, uh, you know, up along the coast of the Northeast, the fluke is a very popular fish. Uh, so I want to do something just in case you're out there fluke fishing and you're uh, cooking it the same way over and over, which tends to be uh, people like to crumble some garlic, put the fluke in some tin foil, and uh, they bake it and they go, well, it kind of tastes the same. A little garlic, white wine, lemon, and tin foil steamed up. It's not bad, but uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, texture either. So tonight I'll show you how to uh, cook up some fluke in your pan. We're gonna dredge that in a white flour with a little bit of salt and pepper. That's gonna go over a couscous salad, a Mediterranean, uh, an Israeli couscous, pearl couscous. And the other dish I'm gonna do is skirt steak. And that's gonna be topped with a little chimichurri. A uh, great dish for these summer months. The chimichurri sauce is cool and uh, works really well, uh, especially after you've taken something hot off the barbecue. We're going to pair that up with some roasted fingerling potatoes. I'm going to toast that in a lemon vinaigrette, and that's going to be our warm potato salad because you could serve it on the warm side. You don't have to worry about trying to time these potatoes specifically with your entree. Uh, and they're really great. The next day as well so keep that in mind so i'm going to get started with a couple of items and uh, the first thing i'm going to do is back here i've got a pot on the pot on the stove and it has a cup and a quarter of chicken broth so that's boiling away and i have here a cup of pearl couscous. They look like little, tiny, tiny little marbles. And uh, there's uh, a tricolor. So there's regular wheat, spinach, and carrot flavor. And uh, this, as I said, is called Israeli couscous. So I'm gonna put that right into the boiling water, or in this case, the boiling chicken stock. You could use water, and if you do, just make sure you season it up with a good bit of salt. I put in a dash of olive oil as well. And now I'll just give that a, a quick stir. 
Make sure it's boiling. And you want to cook it. Your package will tell you to cook it for about eight to 10 minutes. So why don't we split the difference? Okay, it's been cooking for about 30 seconds. Alexa, set a timer for four minutes. I like to set the timer, give it a stir and do it again. But what I want to do is make sure I'm at a simmer. I'll let that start to simmer away. I'll take another pan and I'm just gonna put a low heat under this pan because I'm gonna cook the fluke in there, but I don't want that pan warm or cold. I want it good and hot. So when that fluke hits the pan, it's ready to cook. It's not sitting in a room temperature oil or anything like that. So. I'm just starting to put some heat under that pan. Now on your cutting board, and at this point in time, uh, actually we'll stay right where we are, but you'll see here, we have our fluke. This would have been the tail of the fluke. And up here is where the, uh, what we would call the neck of the fluke. So the fluke's head would have been right here. And the fluke is a flat, roundish fish. And this is one of the two fillets that you'll get out of your fluke if you caught it yourself. Otherwise, you could go to the store and buy it. That's not a bad idea either. So if Marley is still there, if she hasn't checked out, Marley, now would be a good time to cut to the cutting board camera as our pinned video. That would be a great idea. Thank you, Marley. So there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of work that has to be done with this fish. You are not, going to be scaling the fish and you're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, filleting the fish off of the skin or anything like that. So I think we're on the cutting board at this point, Marley, but there is one thing you could do. And if you don't want to do it yourself, when you buy this at the store, at your fishmonger, just ask them to do it. Up here by the neck, these are called some neck bones. And you can almost hear it. You just feel it with your fingers. They're very, very small and they don't go in that deep. So what I do is what I call the V cut. And you can ask your fishmonger at the store, say, hey, can you just give me a little V cut up by the neck? And if they don't know what they're saying, what you're saying, just say, can you cut out, can you cut out the bones up at the, at the neck? That's all that is. And that's all you're gonna lose right there. It's just a little piece of fish. Of fish. If you're a fluke fisherman or a fluke fisher woman, you could save this every time and use it as bait because one of the best fluke baits is fluke. They love fluke. They love themselves. So what I have here are, uh, you know, as I said, this is just one filet. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this filet. already kind of split but you'll see we've got these two two pretty long pieces here and i think what i'll do is just for the sake of cutting uh or for the pan rather i'm going to cut one and turn it into three three little fillets okay so again if if you're not sure where you're, i'm looking look right up top there's that little camera that says cutting board camera so i put it down to three pieces back here as i mentioned i've got a I've got a pan on the oven that's starting to get good and warm. Now's a good time for you to hit it with a little bit of olive oil. If you want to use a nonstick pan here, that works great. So I'm bringing up some temperature here on my pan. Alexa, stop. Alexa, set a timer for four minutes. It is important to keep the temperature on the couscous down so that you're not going to burn it to the bottom of the pan. You might always burn a little bit to the bottom of the pan. A little bit will get stuck. That's okay. But uh, it should be at, a, at a, just a nice light simmer. So I have my olive oil warming up over there. On the cutting board, I have some regular white flour. 
I put that back on the cutting board camera there. And I'm gonna take a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And if you wanna fancy this up with some other flavors, maybe something Cajun, go right ahead. Now's your chance to do it. Get a little bit of salt in there. And what I wanna do is just kind of mix this around. And this is what we would call a dry batter. You can call this a dry batter. Anytime you don't put some liquid in here into your flour, that's gonna be a dry batter. Obviously, if we were doing something like buttermilk chicken or buttermilk fluke, we would have a separate wet batter station with probably buttermilk. And we would go from the fluke into the buttermilk back into the uh, flour into the buttermilk, into the flour. And if we wanted to even do it once or twice, so you get a real super extra crispy crust on that. That's the way we do uh, buttermilk chicken and things like that. So I have my seasoned flour. Behind me, I have my olive oil working quite nicely. And one piece at a time will do. I'm just gonna roll the Roll the fluke in that flour. Make sure it's covered. We want to knock off any excess fluke. And the fluke is nice and dry. If yours is not dry, it's a good idea to pat it dry. You don't want some of these fluky juices sitting on them. Now the fluke is what we also call a summer flounder. And it's called that because people think, oh, well, it's a flounder that you catch in the summer. And that's why it's called a summer flounder. Uh, biologically speaking, this is not the same fish as a flounder. A fluke is a larger fish than a flounder. A fluke will appear up here in the north in warmer waters. The flounder likes the colder temperatures. A flounder can grow Oh, they'll probably only get to about five pounds or so. Whereas a fluke can grow up to, believe it or not, 20 pounds. Now, if you're out there and you're catching, and you catch a 20 pound fluke, that's a fluke. Uh, thank you. But a five, six, eight, nine pound fluke, that's a great catch. That's a very, very good catch. But the flounder are smaller. And, you know, you'll see these, in, in mislabeled a lot of times. Sometimes they're called lemon sole. I'm just gonna take one piece of butter here and throw this into my olive oil. All right, let's, let's bring you over here and get you a closer look here at our fluke spot here. So you see there, I got my butter and I put that into the olive oil and we know this is good and hot. And now what I wanna do is start to get some of the fluke in there. Very important. I wanna know the oil is hot when I put the fish in and I can hear it right away. Alexa, stop. That's the end of the couscous. See, that fish moves right away. That's good. I've got enough oil under there. I'm in good shape. I'm going to put the second one in. Kind of take my time a little bit. But that allows the temperature of the pan to come back up. I keep these babies separated so as to not crowd it too much. And that's the start of our... Uh, Pan fluke right here. It's already seasoned up nicely because as you saw, we did salt and pepper right into the flour. Now over here, I have my couscous. And that is the couscous. All the liquid has been cooked out. and the couscous has absorbed the liquid. You can see here, nothing is really stuck to the bottom of the pan. It tells me that I was able to have 
uh, the correct amount of liquid and the correct amount of heat. But just work that around. And at this point, I'm going to keep the lid off of this. I can let any residual steam leave. Now, our fluke's been on for about a minute and a half or so. And again, what we want to do is we want to check. We want to make sure that we're keeping enough liquid, in this case, the olive oil and the butter mixture. We want to make sure that we've got enough under the fish. That's very important. So this piece went in first. And I got a little bit of a curl on the tail there. That's okay. I'll just hold that down. Want to get good coloration here. So I want to check this. Getting beautiful color on that fish right there. I'd say about 30 seconds more, and then I'm going to flip them. So I'm also going to finish this in the oven. We have all purpose flour with some salt and pepper. And here we have olive oil with just a dash of butter. As I mentioned before, the olive oil has, has good flavor to it, but it also smokes a lot easier than peanut oil or canola oil or something like that. So by adding a little touch of butter, a little bit of fat, we, uh, we raise the smoke point. And we're not gonna get too smoky in here. But as I can see, the fish is moving off of the pan beautifully. Very important, I flip away from myself. You don't want to flip towards yourself because if anything is going to pop out, it's going to pop on you. So you flip away. And again, now it's time to make sure that the olive oil in that pan gets under this new side so that we can get the same wonderful golden color on the other side that we have right here. That's really looking nice. Marley, how are you? Are you okay out there? I hope you are okay, Marley. Just gonna take a little, a little nub of butter right here as well. I just let that finish off right in the pan. Get that underneath. Okay. Everybody, right, stay. There we go. Alexa, set a timer for two minutes, would you? Marley, I was just checking in on you to make sure you were okay. Yeah, I just lost the Zoom meeting actually for a second. I put it in a corner of the screen and then it disappeared. <laughs> but it's all good. So everyone's watching is having a good time, looks like. No, no okay, problem. Yeah. Yeah, no. Okay, no problem. Just wanted to make sure of that. So I have my couscous back there working. And uh, what I want to do now is just sort of freshen up that couscous with a couple of items. So Take my couscous and I'm going to take some right out here. Now, if you want to serve this dish cold, you know, the hot fluke on top of cold couscous, that's not a problem. That's a great way to serve this. So for now, what I'm going to do is just going to take a little bit of couscous and I'm going to put it right into the pan, or right into this bowl rather. I'm going to finish it off with a little bit of olive oil as well so that I can prevent some of sticking together too much. Same here. Then we're going to flavor this couscous up. Olive oil is in. And I just worked that around. I'm going to separate this whole thing, but why bother? I'll eat it all. So my couscous is going to go right in here. Flavored it up. Kind of a comforting snack. Just like 
you know, pasta with cheese and butter, couscous with a little bit of butter, some cheese, uh, and a good bit of salt. Because it, it is a grain, it is a pasta product. Alexa, stop. The fluke is done. So I'm going to take a little bit of salt and pepper into our couscous. And now we're going to do some, some green onion in here. I think there's one, one sort of longish green onion. And if we have the cutting board camera available, we'll do that. Look at that. You see how good? You see how good Marley is? Sorry about that. So let's get some of this green onion. I shouldn't be looking at the camera when I'm cutting like this, but I can see, I can see the knife on, the, on that angle. So we're all okay. So I'm gonna take this green onion, put that right in there. I've already put some olive oil in. I need a little parsley to freshen it up as well. If you want to make this a little more Mediterranean, you can use parsley, but I would also add a little bit of dill. And I would add maybe a little bit of feta cheese as well. i put some parsley in there. Certainly we want to get some lemon. Let's get some of that lemon zest first. Got that right here. And you can see that coloration in the lemon where it goes from yellow to white. That's the pith. Okay, the pith is a little bitter. So you don't want to keep zesting. You want to stay right there. Okay, you don't want to get the pith off. Leave the pith on. Don't get. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you. So a little bit of that lemon zest going to go right in here. And some lemon juice. That's really going to make it a very, very fle uh, fresh flavor with that lemon. In particular, I like this dish for the summer as well. I do like it served cold because it really, uh, it offers a nice contrast to the, to the hot fluke. You can make it ahead of time. Again, you don't have to worry about trying to climb it out with anything else. You know, the less things you're cooking at once, the better, to be honest. This way you can enjoy your party and you'll, you'll actually, you know, you'll nail it. So I got a couple of great tomatoes here as well. And I'll cut these in four. These are kind of on the larger side. We'll work those in. If you don't want to use lemon, you want to maybe use a little bit of vinegar. That's fine. Just want to get some sort of uh, acid in there. And I would pair this meal up with maybe a, maybe a crisp Pinot Grigio or sort of a, a, a fruity Sauvignon Blanc. Put a good Sauvignon Blanc, you know? Not one of those $4 bottles. That's too sweet for me. All right, I think we're looking beautiful here. So I would take my couscous. right in the middle of my plate. A couple of tomatoes in there, especially as the summer gets here. And you've all got your wonderful tomatoes that are gonna be ready for eating. That's gonna be good, I'm sure. I'm sure you've all planted a lot of tomatoes. Back here, I'm just taking a pan out of the oven that I had sitting in there. Just 
So now I'll take, and now I'm just gonna take these two pieces of fluke. And you see, you see how easy the, the fish releases from the pan? And it's not, you know, it's not oily or anything like that. It's got a wonderful little crispness to it. Just kind of fold them right there. Or you have that one large piece if you like. Whatever works for you, whatever floats your boat. Now, as I was saying, the thing with this fluke is it's got nice flavor from obviously putting a breading on it. But if the oil's not hot enough, that's going to get very mushy very quick. It hits the oil and kind of dies it we don't want that we want it to uh snap crack on pop as soon as it hits that oil and i think what i would do the last thing i would hit it with a little bit more lemon right on the fluke i think that is uh that looks like a winner to me marley that looks really tasty you can always Drop a little parsley on there too. Kind of keeps it fresh, adds a little bit of flavor. But I'm really happy with the, the sort of the golden brown color that I got on that fluke. I'll just take a little piece here. It cooks up quick, fluke. Just remember that. It cooks up nice and quick. You can see smoke is coming off it. Mmm. That's tasty. Very happy with that. We'll go back to the other angle, Marley. Why not? Excellent. Woo. Very happy with that one. So, again, back here, I've got a, a pan on the oven, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, just to finish off with that fluke. The couscous salad is uh, really just something you can play with. Again, if I said if you want to make it sort of more Mediterranean, you could also add uh, some cucumber. So just cut your cucumber down the middle, scoop out the seeds, and then just use the, uh, the meat part of the cucumber. Uh, the seeds are going to be releasing a lot of liquid into it. So I would try to scoop the seeds out, chop up some cucumber, maybe cube up some regular beef steak tomatoes or a plum tomato, something like that, a little bit of feta, a little bit of dill, and you're going to have a really, uh, a really Mediterranean style salad, especially again, hit that with a little bit of uh, olive oil and lemon juice. Very tasty. And the fluke, if you can't get fluke, uh, like I said, try to, you know, I, I was just using it because it was one of the flatfish that we catch around Long Island, but fluke, flounder, uh, gray sole, lemon sole, They'll all work. You can pair whatever you really want on this. If you if you had striped bass and you had a nice hearty piece of grilled striped bass, that'll go great over this as well. So make it your own. This is just uh, a suggestion. Okay. So enjoy that fluke dish. Next up, we'll do a little steak with some chimichurri. And the first thing I have to do is, uh, well, I'm going to just pop these potatoes back in the oven. Oh, well, there's no real reason to, but I want to show you these potatoes. And you can see how crispy they got and the wonderful color on them. That's a beautiful, beautiful color on those fingerling potatoes. I'll get to the potatoes in a moment. First things first, I got this hot pan back here again. And I'm going to... It's, it was sitting in the oven, as a matter of fact, when I had the fluke sitting in there because I wanted to just get the pan hot. It's an oven safe pan. Why not? I can do what I want. I'm the boss here. I'm the boss here right now because my wife left. <laughs> so I get a little bit of olive oil on there. Here we go. This is skirt steak. So what do we know about skirt steak? It's very thin. 
very thin piece of meat. And uh, it's got just the right amount of fat to it. It's not crazy loaded with fat, but there's there's enough fat to it. Look how look how long and thin it is. This is less than a half a pound of meat. So, you know, if you're thinking, oh my God, that's a lot of beef. It is a lot of beef, but by weight, you know, uh, if you had a New York strip that was this big, it would weigh probably 25 ounces. This weighs less than eight ounces. So there's not a ton of uh, waste when you buy this from the supermarket or your butcher. There is fat on it, but that's okay. That's flavor. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to, Lay this down on the board. I'm going to cut it into two pieces so that it'll fit nicely onto my grill pan. The price of steak has gone crazy. So this is, as I said, this is skirt steak. It's not known to be the highest quality steak by a long shot. I would put skirt steak into the into the realm of a uh, you know, flank steak, something like that. You know, it's got fat. It's not the most Perfect cut. You want to have it sliced thin so that it's it's good to the mouth when when you're chewing on it. Uh, it's something you want to you might want to marinate. You don't have to, but it's not. This is not filet mignon here. But the price of this today at the store I was at, which is normally very well priced, this skirt steak was twenty seven ninety nine a pound. I was I was shocked. New York strip was only ten dollars a pound. Ribeyes were twelve ninety nine a pound. I asked why skirt steak has gone up so much. Uh, the butcher he could not give me uh, the he couldn't give me an answer. So I'm not sure. But this was the recipe that I had said we would do. And for my good friends at the Hot Pot Library, I'm going to get the pricey piece of beef. Okay even though I'll probably be the one who has to eat it. Uh, what can I tell you? So salt and pepper, no need to complicate this thing. That's okay, you can stay, we can stay on the, uh, on this one here. I'm gonna bring this over to the pan. I'll, I'll show you the pan right here. I'm using right now a griddle pan or a grill pan rather, sorry. Cast iron, it's blue. It's a very nice pan. Might look black to you there, but there you can see the blue. I've got it good and hot. Same concept though, if I were grilling it uh, outdoors, I'm starting to see some smoke rise. And that's important. We wanna see smoke rise. Wanna make sure it's hot. We wanna hear it first. That's That sounds pretty sizzly to me. Now I'm gonna make sure I got the temperature up all the way because when I put the steak onto that pan, the temperature of the pan drops just a little bit. We want it to be very, very hot. This is the other piece here, which is much thinner. So I put that one on first. But overall, this is gonna cook relatively quickly. Alexa, set a timer for two minutes. Now, if I start to go with this right now with a spatula or a set of tongs the meat is not going to peel off the pan and i don't want it to it's not ready same thing on your grill we have a tendency to put the meat on the grill then we start wanting to turn it flip it there's no need to do that you want to wait about two minutes or so and that's going to sear the salt and the pepper to the beef and that's going to create a crust which is exactly what we want we want to create a good crust here. <laughs> My friend is keeping time for me. So now might be a good idea, Marley, to bring us to our board here. So Marley's going to take us right to the Thank you Marley. 
I've got one clove of garlic there. I got a little bit of salt left here. Just a little bit more salt right on that clove of garlic. I take my knife. I smash the garlic right into the salt, just like that. And now I start to move the garlic through the salt. Salt is now acting like an abrasive, almost like when they salt the streets, melt the snow, melt the tire stick, things like that. So as you see there, I run the garlic right through all that salt to the point where it almost looks like it's gone, but it's not. See, I scoop it right back up. Beautiful. Alexa, stop. There we are. Alexa, set a timer for three minutes. So I've got the, I've got this garlic right here. I'm gonna let that sit in with a little bit of black pepper. I don't need salt. And what I'm doing together, I'm putting together a lemon vinaigrette for you. A little bit of Dijon mustard. So I have salt, pepper, I have Dijon mustard. I want to get some lemon juice in there. How about a half a lemon here? That should do. So we got a drunk customer here in the back. Sorry about that, folks. We get a little smoky in here, so I'm just going to let that steak sit in the oven. So I have the. I got a pit in there. Let's get that out. I have some uh, lemon juice. I have the salt, pepper. I have the Dijon mustard. I'm going to put some herbs in there. A little bit of fresh parsley. Your recipe says dried herbs, and that's fine too. If you have dried parsley or dried thyme sitting around, go for it. Don't worry about it. So the parsley goes in. Now I want to start to whisk this all together. Got my olive oil. And these are sort of the, uh, the flavors here. We have the Dijon mustard there. Uh, that acts not just a flavor, but to emulsify this dressing, to, to give it a creamy look and a bit of a thickness to it. And we want to whisk right through the oil. And by doing that, we open up all the molecules of fat inside the olive oil, and that can accept the flavors. Give it a flavor check there. Ooh, that's good. A little too tangy for, for my taste. So if you taste it, and you, woo, you go like, woo, just add a little more olive oil. But that's tasty. Okay, wonderful. Now, as far as the potatoes are concerned, because we're going to put that vinaigrette on the potatoes. Alexa, stop, please. Thank you. Okay. A lot going on here, folks. There's a lot going on. I got the steak out right now. And the reason I have the steak out now, simply, it's done cooking. So I'm going to let it rest. I'm going to take it off the grill pan. Uh, 
and I'll just let it rest. Instead of this pan smoking up the house, I'm going to leave it here in the oven. So fingerling potatoes, these wonderful little potatoes that look like that. What I do is I just cut them right down the middle. You can do that, I promise you. So after you've gotten them washed up, you're obviously not going to peel these. Just run them under some cold water in case there's any residual dirt left on them. Slice them long ways and put them into a pot of room temperature water with a lot of salt, a good couple of tablespoons of salt. Uh, bring it to a boil. Let it sit at a boil for about one minute. That's all you need. That's going to cook the potato almost all the way. Drain it. And then take those potatoes, hit it with a little bit of olive oil and toss them. And then put them onto a sheet tray like this with a little bit of parchment. I got some parchment on here. You don't have to use parchment, but if you want to, go right ahead. And you want to roast them for anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes, about 400 degrees. And then salt them at the end. You don't want to salt them too early because they've already gotten salt from the water. So there's good flavor there. But salt on the outside of these even more. They're really not going to get to the crispy stage that we want. We want these to crisp up. So uh, keep that in mind. Now that they're done, they get a little bit of salt. Or if you think, geez, I got salt in the in the lemon vinaigrette, then don't put any salt on. You're the boss. Now, over here. I have a uh, just a little food food processor, and I need some red wine vinegar. That'll work just fine. Some Goya red wine vinegar there, and we're gonna make a chimichurri. So uh, some chimichurris use only parsley. This we're gonna use a little bit of parsley, a little bit of cilantro. So I start out with a couple of dashes of red pepper flakes for a little bit of heat, some cumin. Cumin has a wonderful aromatic flavor to it. That's done there. Uh, where's my, where's my spot? Black pepper. Touch of salt. We're looking good here. And I'm gonna kind of work in reverse here. So we need more parsley than we do cilantro. So I'm gonna start out by putting my parsley in there. And I got some cilantro as well. If you're a big cilantro fan, you want extra cilantro, go for it. You're the boss. Just a dash of the red wine vinegar. A little goes a long way on the vinegar. Same with when you're making that vinaigrette. It's usually going to be about one part acid, in this case vinegar or lemon juice, to about two or three parts of oil. It's a very simple sauce. And if you get it right, it goes great on chicken, fish, steak, obviously, shrimp, shrimp tacos. Really uh, an easy sauce that you should have in your repertoire. So. The consistency of it should be should be that of a uh, a pesto almost a little thinner, but about the consistency of a pesto.
you taking a look at it. Push it down, make sure all the blades are getting, getting at it. Take a taste. Way too much vinegar still. Get my olive oil in there. Sick. Let's see. Much better. Here's where you got to play with the flavors a little bit. A little more salt, I think. Touch more of that cumin. A little more heat. That should, uh, that should just about do it. I'll give it one more zap. Wonderful. I could have lied to you and said that on the very first try it came out great. But why? Why would I lie to you? All right, we have our I'll take a bowl here and take some of my tomatoes. I'm going to add just a little bit of the vinaigrette, not a lot. A little goes a long way here. So just a touch of the vinaigrette. That's it. That's just, just enough to coat those potatoes. A little uh, of the, uh, I almost said Oaxaca cheese. Uh, the white cheese that you would see on Mexican street corn could go on here, or even just a little bit of Parmesan. That's a nice way to tighten that up as well. So what I'm gonna do here is piece of steak. In this case, I've got a nice rare piece. And the steak's been resting for about five minutes or so. Beautiful. You want to make sure you let that steak rest. The reason being, when the temperature hits the steak, it, it runs the blood and the liquids throughout the steak, and that's what cooks the steak. So letting it rest allows everything to come back in and lets the, the liquids come back to the center of the steak and therefore tenderizing the steak. And if you don't let it rest, you cut it right away, you're going to lose it all with the flowing right out really fast. So I'll take this steak, I'll move it off to the side. Put on my board here for a moment. So I can put put some wonderful pieces of the steak here. Kind of fan it out a little bit like that. That looks really nice. Couple of our potatoes. Last but not least, we have our chicken. Take a spoon here. Get 
got bright green, that is, I hope. Beautiful. Now just take some of that chimichurri. You're going to drizzle it right over that steak, but you don't want to bury it because it's got the beautiful red color that we that we want. We want our neighbors to see if we know how to cook a steak. You don't want to be sending out that gray steak. But that is a beautiful summer dish right there. Chimichurri over skirt steak with lemon vinaigrette dressed fingerling potatoes roasted. Marley, how about a close up on that one? Let's go to that cutting board camera for one last shot of it. What do you say? Beautiful, Marley. There you go. You want to kind of build those potatoes up, stack them up if you can. And we'll cut back to the regular one if we can, Marley. The regular pin. And do we have any questions? Let me check. I think we might be good. You have done a very great job of answering questions as you go. Like, I feel like usually people ask, what wines do you pair it with? And you did that for the first dish. I'm not sure if you did for the second one, but that's just- You know, in this dish, I did not. And because it's the summer, some people think, oh, it's beef. You have to have, you have to have a red wine. You don't necessarily have to have a red wine. You could have uh, just a nice, crisp uh, Chablis with this. And Chablis is a, uh, I think it's a Chardonnay grape from France. And uh, that's got a little bit of body to it. So I, I could live with that. I could also live with a, a rosé for this dish as well. If, if you insisted on having a red, then maybe a Pinot Noir. And don't be afraid to chill that Pinot Noir for a little bit if you wanted to. Right, that's a question. I don't see any other ones right now. Do you have any other things that you'd like to perhaps talk about or anything that you'd like to suggest? Or things no, like I, uh, as I said, with regards to this beef, it's a uh, very pricey cut right now. I don't know why skirt steak is so expensive. It just is. Uh, so if you want to do this dish, but you don't want to spend that kind of money, I don't blame you. I would get flank steak. Flank steak is a uh, very versatile piece of beef and it works great with this dish. So save a couple of bucks, use flank steak. If you wanted to you know, make tacos, skirt steak is great for beef tacos, and uh, so is flank steak. But again, skirt steak is very pricey right now, so don't be afraid for a cheaper one. Um, and as I said, these, these potatoes, you don't have to worry about trying to keep them scorching hot to serve them with the dinner. This is your roasted potato salad, so you can serve it at room temperature. And it's not a mayonnaise base, so you don't have to worry about uh, leaving it out too long. I think you can leave it out all day, but I know that's something that worries people, particularly in the summer. Um, but I want to thank Marley for directing tonight's cooking show. You're an incredible director, Marley. And the good folks over there at the Hot Pog Library are very lucky to have you. I'm gonna do wait another minute or so for questions. And if not, thank you for being as always a wonderful presenter and offering such wonderful advice. But just I'm gonna give it another minute and then otherwise we will, you know, close off. Did you hear the part, Marley, where I said that you're uh, a wonderful director? Also, if uh, Marley can get a raise. I also think that uh, we should give Marley a raise. This is how I know she's listening right now. I'm listening. I'm just checking the chat. So I'm not saying it. Oh. But um, but well, yeah. you should get a raise. <laughs> All right. So thank you again. And hopefully, very we'll welcome. See you again soon. All right. We'll be seeing you.